actually just to save time, uh, we'll ask Anton uh, to introduce himself. Um, and, uh, Dr. Mazen, but you have to the next one because it's the eco. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. And uh, just so that you people here see. We have, uh, uh, we have in this room a few people, by the way. Uh, and there are other people online. So, um, so what I'll do is, Anton, if you permit me, just uh, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Because <laughs> uh, I just didn't get a chance to even go back and look over your uh, bio. If you can just explain to people who you are and and your background, and then uh, you can go ahead and share your screen and start whenever you can. Sounds good. <clears throat> so I start. Uh, hi, everyone. It's nice to see you. And uh, so I, to introduce myself, I'm, I would say I'm a soil ecologist, and I'm interested in everything related to soil biodiversity and biodiversity in general and i'm particularly interested to link uh, biodiversity with functioning of ecosystems and uh, i'm doing it mostly by analyzing animal food webs uh, and my background is actually soil science so i graduated in moscow state university and now I'm in Germany already for six years and working with soil animal ecology. First in Göttingen with Professor Stefan Scheu and now I'm in, um, in Leipzig leading my independent research group at IDIF. And I have two directions, main directions of my work. One direction is just, I would like to understand how different animals and interact with each other and how they interact with environment uh, and plants and microbes in soil. And the second direction is that I would like to understand the global patterns uh, of distribution of soil biodiversity and related functions. <clears throat> so this is, was the short introduction and now I would share my screen. I have to apologize in advance because I lost my voice this week. So at some point I may uh, stop talking loudly. Um, do you see my screen now in a presentation mode? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So the known stock is about global monitoring uh however i would also focus on uh, soil food webs because um, in my research i use this approach to link soil biodiversity with ecosystem functioning overall it's about 90 percent of primary production in terrestrial ecosystems that is allocated below ground and soil food webs are responsible for uh, about, uh, a sorry, I just have to switch off the auto, uh, auto switch to the next slide because otherwise it will be automatically Okay, anyway, good. So uh, the fate of this primary production will depend then on the interaction between plants and microbes and animals. And this interaction are happening in soil food webs. So plants supply uh, resources that fuel below ground life. And this life is very complex. And depending on these interactions, we have vital functions and services delivered, such as food and timber production, water regulation, purification, and carbon sequestration, decomposition, greenhouse gases emission, 
this isn't pest control and of course above ground by bi biodiversity support so basically uh well with understanding of these interactions we can have a closer understanding on the ecosystem functioning that is driven by soil biota so how do soil animals specifically affect these processes if we look very simply uh, the carbon cycling in soil it goes through plants and then plants allocate some carbon into soil and then depending on climatic conditions on soil vegetation and microbial communities it can be either respired in the atmosphere or sequestered in in the form of soil organic matter and soil animals and soil food webs here affect soil and vegetation and microbial communities through two main mechanisms which is transformation and translocation of materials and selective feeding on certain microbial functional groups by that they change the function of ecosystems and one may assume that this uh, effects are small but they are not in some cases at least and here are some numbers to convince you so it is about 50 percent of terrestrial animal biomass that is found in soil and these soil animals can be responsible for 11 to 27 percent of little carbon loss and it has been recently shown that insects are responsible for about 30 percent of global deadwood carbon loss uh, but locally these effects can be even smaller in the, or larger and they may go up to 70 percent enhancing enhanced decomposition or plant productivity in certain ecosystems or laboratory settings and these mechanisms by which soil animals affect these functions they are related to feeding and this is why soil food webs so food relationships between these different components are important to understand <clears throat> So now what I'm talking about, this is some examples of soil biodiversity. And here you see fungi, columbula, and mites, and bowerpots, and isopods, and even some mammals. So my point here that this is a very high diversity in soils, although it's not visible. And to understand all these animals together is very complex but when we look on the soil we see something like this so it's very hard to really observe soil interactions so that's why we're using a lot of indirect methods to get insights into it such as stabilized tops fatty acid analysis and different molecular techniques but also some traditional knowledge that we have accumulated so in my presentation I will be focused on the following questions. So, how this soil food webs are structured, how this structure then is related to soil functions, and what are the patterns and drivers of soil food webs at large spatial scales? So, here we're going to be talking about this global monitoring we have. And I will go through essential concepts in soil food web research and reconstruction, and I will try to link soil food webs to functioning of soils, and then I will introduce global assessment of soil food webs in the framework of soil bond, which is the global monitoring network which we are establishing right now. So, if we look in the soil, we have a different kinds of organisms there this is example of plants and microbes but also we have different animals there starting from very small ones to middle and large ones and this is a very simplified picture but even if we look in this picture actually all these groups interact with each other so this is a very complex system and to understand how this system functions, we need to understand how these interactions are formed. 
in soil. And for that, we usually have, uh, use this resource-based approach, which means that we have different animals that are feeding on different resources in soil, such as some feeding on living plants, others living on litter or soil organic matter or dead wood, others feeding on microbes or algae. And these different animals, because of feeding on different resources, they play different roles in soil food webs. And here we have uh, major groups of herbivores, decomposers, omnivores, and carnivores. But there is much more uh, trophic diversity inside these groups. And uh, actually this information is poorly systematized. So which exactly animals feed on which? And that's why we recently published this big review on the feeding habits on different soil associated consumers. And on the right side, you see this different examples. And what we did, we actually compiled all the information from literature, classical literature, and also more modern literature that uses different molecular techniques to understand what is happening in soil. And this is just a simple summary that has like all these different kinds of organisms, uh, groups, of course, it's not species, it's high level taxa that uh, is, are plotted against different resources here. And uh, well, bubbles of different size reflects trophic interactions to different resources. And as you may notice that most of these groups are linked to several resources. And uh, which means that basically soil food webs, uh, in soil food webs, each organism uh, or a group of organisms uh, is feeding on multiple resources. So, but not on all. So we still can understand and structure this. Uh, the system using also body sizes and other information we have. And at the end, we could reconstruct these trophic relationships as shown here. This is example of uh, very large scale meta food web reconstruction, which includes all resources, but also different kinds of consumers from very small to very large. It actually includes even birds in the same network. And this approach allows us to analyze together organisms from bacteria to birds in a single interaction network. As you see here, the span of body size is from now one nanogram to one kilogram. So this was um, a part where I was talking about how soil food webs are structured and uh, now I'm going to be talking about how the structure of soil food webs can be linked to soil functions, which I'm interested in. And here, luckily enough, there was a <clears throat> relatively recent publication, which called Energy Flux. And the Energy Flux concept is that uh, living organisms, especially consumers, are modifying their environment and ecosystem processes by trophic interactions, mostly by feeding on other organisms. Uh, and it's not necessarily trophic interaction itself, but it's usually uh, the functions that uh, animals play in ecosystems, they're linked to trophic interactions. And here are some examples from different ecosystems, such as we have pest control and pollination, water purification, decomposition, and so on, depending on how intensively different organisms consume each other. And if we apply this concept to soil food webs, we can also find very straightforward patterns. So if we talk about small organisms, they may feed on bacteria. There is a process of bacteria worry, which is linked to release of nutrients in the soil and to plant nutrition and plant growth. There is a process of also fungivore or soil feeding that may, may be linked to dynamics of soil organic matter, but also to soil structure itself, such as we can imagine earth form feeding on soil, it supports soil structure and water regulation, and also translocation of organic matter in the soil. 
And basically, the more earthworms we have, the more soil they consume, the more intensive this process is. And we can quantify this. And we can quantify this using metabolic ecology principles so that depending on body mass, organism needs a certain amount of energy to sustain its life. And then if we come back to this food web I showed you before, so this is a very uh, small schemes, uh, which the same was shown. to high trophic level and quantify the intensity of these processes that is linked some empirical example from our studies in Indonesia I uh, while in my while my project uh, was in Göttingen I, I worked in Indonesia in tropical rainforests and my the aim of my project was to compare uh, rainforest with highly degraded ecosystems such as oil palm plantations and to see what is happening with different processes in the soil and with biodiversity. And basically, we could reconstruct these soil food webs as shown on the left in different kinds of organisms we observe there in tropical rainforests. And we could quantify the synergy fluxes depending on different functions they play in the ecosystem. And then we could, could compare it, let's say, with oil palm to understand what is the difference of these systems in terms of animal contribution to ecosystem functioning. And you visually see that the network is very different on the left and on the right. But to quantify it, we can sum up energy fluxes and <coughs> you see that the total energy flux is the same. And what is different is certain functions. For example, in plantations, we have five times less predation, which means that we have much lower potential biocontrol of uh, different kinds of animals. But also, we have very different rates of soil transformation and wood transformation, which have implications for decomposition processes, but also for soil structure. And main pattern that we observe here is highlighted in bold that there is a size spectrum inequality. So in oil palm, we have most of the energy floating into very large consumers, actually it's earthworms which sequester energy from the rest of the food web. And if, if you notice, there is a number of different bars on this plot. And by estimating these different functions, we can go to the concept of trophic multifunctionality, which means that, okay, we can evaluate individual functions, but we may be interested in some indicator that show us overall performance of an ecosystem. And here there are three, for example, um, indicators we could use. It's total energy flux, so how much energy in general are processed by animals. But sometimes we have systems where we have very low biodiversity but high energy flux. And in such situation maybe makes more sense to use multifunctionality in a way that we calculate the average across all functions that we have, or we see how many functions fall beyond a certain threshold. And in this case, we could evaluate the total performance of a certain ecosystem or a certain soil food web. So this is more a conceptual story. And of course, there is still some hypothesis to be tested. So <clears throat> we still have to understand how well 
these processes evaluated in soil food web reconstructions are linked to the ecosystem level processes and what it depends on this connection. So if we measure herbivory, it wouldn't be the same as we estimate herbivory from the energy flux approach. And same relates to soil transformation, water regulation, for example. And the overarching hypothesis could be here that this ecosystem multifunctionality, stability and biodiversity positively scales with tropic multifunctionality. So to have a healthy ecosystems, to have a multifunctional ecosystems and stable ecosystems and biodiverse ecosystems, we need to have these features in the food webs that are in this ecosystem, that are present in these ecosystems. So I was showing this to you to just um, give you impression of what my research is about and uh, what other plans, research plans that uh, we have in our global initiative, which I will introduce you now. It's called Soilborn Food Web Team, and it aims at global monitoring of soil animals communities using a common methodology. And this is an extension of the soil bond, which I will uh, tell you in a minute. And actually, in this initiative, our aim are our aims are uh, to compile globally representative data on different groups of soil animals in conjunction with soil functioning. But also, we want to evaluate how climate, land use, and other environmental variables affecting soil communities. We also want to evaluate how nature conservation approaches are they efficient in protecting soil animal communities. And but on the other side, we also want to understand how soil animal communities and food webs related to soil functioning, the approach I told you before today. And finally, we want just to establish a global expert network for soil animal biodiversity monitoring. And we want to reinforce local collaboration network to disseminate expertise in soil zoology and soil animal ecology. So this is our aims. And the question is, if we do anything new, because there are actually recently, <clears throat> there were a number of initiatives that uh, focused on the global scale distribution of soil animals and such as springtails, nematodes, earthworms, or macrofauna. And here are some example maps that were produced. So is there anything new in what we do particularly? And the, the, the answer is yes, there is a lot of new things we do because first of all, this information are coming from, is coming from separate publications. So what we do, we actually want to study comprehensively the entire soil food web across different groups of organisms and get a information about the interaction between these organisms. And second, we also link all this information to soil properties and functions, which is vital if we want to understand how animals affect ecosystems. So basically, this is extension of soil bond network, which studies properties, microbiome and functions. And food web team is related to animal part of the story. And this is our concept on the left side where different drivers, primary drivers such as climate, land use and conservation affect properties of soil, but also soil biodiversity of microbes and animals. And by these interactions, we have finally ecosystem performance in terms of soil functions. And we are adding this missing piece of a puzzle in terms of soil animals, that actually link to all other components and may modify the effects of climate, land use, but also microbes on soil functions. And at present, actually, the soil bond itself includes over 80 countries, and uh, but the soil bond food web, the animal part, I think, covering around 30 countries, where we 
intend to assess like these different size classes of soil animals. And we work is that we have the global coordination network. It's a volunteer initiative. So actually at present, we don't have explicit funds, but we, we apply for certain projects on different scales to support this network, but this network primary is supported voluntarily by researchers around the world. And the organization is that we have the overarching coordination team, but on the national scale, we also encourage to build interaction networks to, uh, to do this research in collaboration. And the national coordinators are then uh, come together in a global meeting and in global meetings and discuss the issues we have or the progress we do. And how do we do that? Is that we go to the field. Actually, I was in the field last week to do exactly this sampling. And this is the images. We have a nice, had a very nice weather. It's quite getting quite cold here in Germany now. So uh, we were lucky. And we're planning to do this activities on around 200 sites because we have quite a bit of things to do on each site. <clears throat> so it's very detailed assessment. And uh, we go step by step. So we have field teams that go in the field like this and sample soils. So it's the first step is sample collection. We have sites 15, uh, 30 by 30 meters and take uh, five locations uh, on this sites. And then what we do, we transfer this uh, samples to certain national or local hubs where the animal extraction is done. And what we do then, we do imaging of animals and collect it. we are collecting images to then uh, train a uh, computer algorithm to classify these animals from the images and to, to groups to count their abundance and estimate the body sizes. With that, uh, we support in, in the central team here in Germany, all the teams by acquiring this information from the images of, uh, that are taken by individual groups all across the world. So we don't really export materials because all the materials are staying now in the labs that did the sampling. And uh, what we intend to do once the data is there, which will likely happen next year, the sampling is now ongoing. We would like to, to reconstruct these food webs I showed you before and link them to soil functions. And this way, we would like to address basically two main questions. Is how soil food webs and soil animal communities are actually linked to soil functioning? And the second question is, what are the main drivers, main global drivers of soil animal communities, of soil animal performance, functional diversity, and what are the main threats to these communities? So in which conditions we have very low animal diversity? Is it, and is the conservation practices we have now in place, do they help us? Do they have, help us to conserve soil animal biodiversity, which is actually vital for the functioning of healthy ecosystems? Yeah, and that's actually it for today. Uh, but if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Anton. <clears throat> this is great. Uh, um, I wish we had a lot more time to digest more of the methodologies. Uh, I asked a couple of questions and then hopefully others will have uh, some questions for you. Um, uh, in this question, one of the difficulties we've had is the uh, systematics is a dying profession, if you want. There are so few people who know, for example, the different species that are there. Uh, we have actually a good collection of leaf litter, uh, meso and macrofauna, uh, and soil uh, things, including columbola, for example, and uh, small beetles, I'm sure many of them are even new species. Uh, 
collaborating uh, the museum and Amal also, Amal Hamdan, are collaborating with the Natural History Museum in London uh, on some molecular methodologies, DNA barcoding, meta barcoding, etc. But I wonder if, uh, you know, my question is, uh, first question is, uh, in terms of this soil biodiversity network, uh, whether maybe you thought of having a database of experts in different groups uh, that we can somehow uh, bother by sending them specimens or whatever for morphological identification. That's the uh, first question. The second question I have is uh, uh, we are now uh, looking at restoration, land restoration, planting trees. And one of the things that would be nice is to see you know, richness of biodiversity in the soil before and after. And I'm wondering what, uh, what do you recommend in terms of methodology for that, that's simple that we can do here in Palestine, not too complicated. We don't have too much resources for doing this. To look, for example, at organic, I know measuring uh, organic content in soil, there are several methods, uh, whatever, but uh, how do we, well, what would you recommend for soil uh, initial analysis before restoration and follow-up analysis after planting uh, native trees? Uh, and, and the third question, sorry, I'm kind of... <laughs> The question is, what do you see our role in this uh, network that you're, uh, you're doing in Palestine? Um, what, what can we do right away, you know, to join this network and be part of this work that you all... Amazing work, by the way, uh, you know, congratulations. It's really very, very important and usually ignored work. <laughs> Sorry, am I uh, being too uh, demanding on your... <laughs> not at all. So thanks for the Go questions. I, I also tried to write them down not to forget. So I, I hope I will be able to answer all of them. So um, I worked in Indonesia as well for six years. And uh, I know well that there is a huge problem in uh, taxonomic expertise, especially for soil invertebrates. And uh, we know something in Europe, but beyond Europe, it's, it's still a lot, maybe in North America, it's a lot to be done. And this is a huge uh, challenge that stays up front. So if we talk about our project, that we first approach it from biomass perspective, this is one of the reasons because we look into major functional groups and their biomass. In this case, this is very, has very low demand for taxonomic expertise. So it can be done by any student, but in perspective, of course, we would like to know what other species they are, because without knowing that we cannot conserve them and we cannot really study their biology in, in the long term. And uh, I actually, find really good your idea of uh, listing experts uh, on different taxonomic groups that could be approached. And this is one of the ideas we were discussing, but I think never implemented yet. And uh, of course, the problem here is that all of them are very busy <laughs> because there is no, not many people. But I believe we should do that. And in fact, now we are planning uh, planning a project where we want to work more in the direction of soil biodiversity co conservation. And I think it would be great to have this network established. And I personally also work in in Saxony in in, in Germany, and we have here a, a Senckenberg. Uh, soil biodiversity museum so it's girlish museum it's, it's this nature science museum but there is a strong group on soil biodiversity and i hope we will be able to establish it as a certain hub of these expertise and maybe in the future we would be able to kind of 
have more people trained in certain groups. So I think this is one of the approaches we could use training and then we uh, could push this forward. So that is, I hope this, this is answers partly your first question. So I will try to be more concise, I guess, with answering another one. So yeah, the second question was, I think about, uh, restoration of soil in general, like a system restoration and which soil indicators could, could be taken. Uh, as a first line assessment, easy one. And well, I, I would not position me as an expert in this topic, but I would intuitively say that monitoring soil carbon is a good idea. Uh, just, I, I believe that in many cases, if we talk about biodiversity restoration, uh, important is to have some detrital inputs on the surface as well. So usually it increases functional diversity of soil animals, in particular, if there is some litter or for example, plant litter on the surface. So one approach would be maybe to also just see how much litter is there on the surface. So this is very simple. Uh, so you don't need anything except of scales or something like that. If we talk about a bit more detailed assessment, I would suggest to, uh, well, for animals, there are very easy methods where you take out the soil monolith, something like 25 by 25 centimeter, and then one can just sort with hands and count how many animals of different kinds is there. But this is method is quite time consuming. So, but this would be uh, more than a robust assessment, I would say. So that would be my kind of non-expert, I will say, suggestions for that. And the last question was about the potential participation. So we are open. We are welcoming uh, to join us. The uh, how we work is that if it's an if there is interest on the site uh, to join, then we have we usually have uh, one national coordinator that are interested to push this forward, and then uh, we establish several sites. Uh, in for example, it could be done in Palestina. Uh, they, um, and these sites are. So our concept is that it should be monitored in long term and that one could revisit the sites after three years, for example, and then after another three years and see what changes in time and these locations. And then the most simple version would be just to have uh, two sites. And what we are interested in especially is um, conservation and non-conservation areas. So we are interested, okay, do we have difference in terms of, um, yeah, in terms of soil biodiversity in different, if, if the land is conserved, if it's protected or not, to see if there is any effect of these practices on soil biodiversity. So how we work is that we usually establish this national coordinator that, co that communicates and there are two uh, blocks there. First block is this core soil bone assessment where uh, we send in you box with vials and you put soil inside and send us back and we do all, all the analysis. So this is the uh, uh, soil bone assessment. But what I was talking about today is also animal assessment, which is soil bone food web. And for that, we actually looking for partners who are familiar with extraction methods or are enthusiastic to learn and implement these methods because we have our web page where we have all the information, all the protocols, which we openly share. So, and this is possible to actually just build such extractors. And uh, I don't know if there is a chat in this, uh, if, if there is a chat in, in Google Meet, I am rarely using it. Can I 
open. Yeah, let uh, me see. I don't see the chat. Anybody made the comment? Anybody has any comments or questions? Of the audience inside the room here or elsewhere? Uh, I, I see the chat, so um, I will. What I will do. Uh, yeah. The chat is in the. Yeah, yeah, I see you put. Yeah. So I will okay. just the link cool. to our web page as well. And on this web page, what you can find is actually openly accessible protocols, what we use. And uh, if there will be interest, you can uh, also see what exactly we do and if it's feasible for you to join. And the way they work that if you interested and uh, could contribute to the sampling, then our idea is to combine all the data globally in one database and then analyze this database and publish several papers. So we answer research questions, but we also publish papers. And uh, of course, all the contributors are invited to, to join this publication. So, but at present, this is voluntarily, uh, voluntary initiative, which means that we cannot pay directly for this work. I, I think uh, we try to enter to the site, uh, but uh, it's need a permission uh, from your site. So we shall we uh, send you the permission for that or to see the. Uh, the link that I'm, I send you. Oh, oh no, sorry. I think so. There the is first, two things. And, uh, yeah, so the first that. one, I think you just can ignore it because it's. Oh, yeah. It's oh, okay. Okay. I got it. I got it. Which I didn't want to create. <laughs> I just was looking for yeah. that. So it's the second link that you can use. This is an open web page. And there you could actually read a um, general introduction about the initiative, but also. There, is a, there are some publications we uh, did and also protocols that we share openly. Mm. We also make videos. <laughs> we also make videos. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Mazin is still there, if, uh, uh, th if there is any chance if the like institution okay. or anything send a trainee, trainee for uh, for your institution to be uh, to take this experience mainly for the um, practical part for uh, collection samples and uh, taking the you know uh, taking photos just photos it will not be good for the analysis so it, there is i think it should be in a professional way special for that uh, program for analysis of uh, species i don't know if uh, there is possibility in the future to, if we think to send somebody there for uh, training program um i think it is possible so uh, of course the uh, we actually have uh, now a, uh, a european scale cost action where we also do some mobility projects like this so people come and to other places and they are being trained in some methods for example mm. so this is possible and we even may have funds for that but i should should check it because if 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 palestina is eligible uh to for that so i will write it down and i will contact uh dr mazin and ask uh about that um well i will yeah i'll press I will to worry. um There's two more questions in the chat now, uh, Anton, if you want to look at them. Uh, so the first question if, if, if about the effects of uh, chemical versus organic fertilizers. And I personally do not uh, work with that but i know that there are literature available and to my knowledge uh, it's 
it's usually that there is a positive effect of organic fertilizers on soil biodiversity, but I think this is context dependent, so it's not that easy. And uh, it also depends on the components that you are interested in. So I would say that, for example, microorganisms, they may be promoted also by chemical fertilizers more, but for larger biodiversity or so small animals or to have more health ecosystem, I would say that uh, organic fertilizers are important. But um, so, for example, we had a recent research in in Russia where we showed that it's it's not the general biodiversity uh, changes, but rather the some kind of structure of the community and stability. So it is not that easy to answer. But I think this is very exciting. Uh, question to study also in particular contexts, such as, for example, in uh, Palestina. So having more data mm -hmm. on that would be uh, really interesting. Mm -hmm. And the second question is uh, research regarding predation in soil amongst its components and the result of this process on soil function. Wow. That is, I like this question because it's very much related to what I interested in. And there, uh, I didn't uh, run explicit experiments on that, but we can definitely uh, um, we can definitely uh, do that. And uh, with this method of energy flux and with uh, manipulative experiments where you have different components of soil biodiversity, and I think that um, there are several studies published in that di this direction that showed. Uh, cascading effects. So depending on predation, on the levels of predation, we can have changes in the rate of decomposition, for example, as would be expected from ecological theory due to trophic cascades. So, but there is also different uh, stories there because predators may prefer certain prey. For example, they may prefer less protected prey or they may prefer small prey over large earth forms. And this also has implications for the overall function of the ecosystem. And by, there is actually additional aspect there that by promoting alternative prey in uh, agricultural ecosystems, we could potentially also improve natural biocontrol of pest species because there will be more predators feeding at the base. So basically we can improve biodiversity and by that we could improve uh, by control. So that's, I don't know how much it answers your question, but, uh, yeah, I think predation is a very, a good indicator of restoration, but I think that it is also difficult to study. So if you, if you want easy indicator, I wouldn't say it's an easy indicator. So, but I think this is very good indicate, like it's very informative. So I think that Maybe predation... like, uh, I mean, uh, like in uh, the outer world of the bigger animals, we look at, for example, presence of raptors as a good indicator of the health of the ecosystem. So maybe if you look at the presence of the predator in soil as a health of the soil biodiversity, maybe that's a simple simple indicator yeah. yeah i agree it's uh the problem is of course uh, with the soil we always have some predators even in very early my early ecosystems yeah. they, uh, but uh okay. there are certain kinds of predators such as for example ground beetles but i think it's also ecosystem specific so we cannot i unfortunately i don't yeah, know yeah. research in Palestinian context. So which exactly yes. indicator predators could we use? Yes, but yes. I think it's worth studying. Okay. Great. I think we're at 12 o'clock now. So time is run out. We usually have those events for one hour. Um, any last quick questions from anybody in the audience? Or shall we wrap it up? Anton, this has been very, very uh, 
informative and, and really good, and we thank you for it. Uh, we have those meetings about every two weeks. Uh, nowadays, we used to have them every week, but uh, we have those continuing education sessions. They also relate to our uh, formulation of the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan. So I also encourage you, if you think of anything that related to soil biodiversity, uh, that we should put in our National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan, uh, we would certainly welcome your thoughts about this. Uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here and uh, thanks for this invitation. And I, I will, what I will do is that maybe I will uh, check, um, I will describe again what we could do together in terms of this mm -hmm. monitoring. I will also send some links to to Mazin if you if uh, because I have his no, contacts sure. and, yeah. and also I will think about your idea of uh, like proposing some something in uh, this direction. But here I would also like to know more about what what you do, how you implement this uh, monitoring or what uh, like strategy. Uh, now, which strategy you have, so then it would be actually interesting to exchange because, as I mentioned, we run this conservation project and it would be a good case if we could also uh, talk about, uh, yeah, implementation of some ideas in Palestinian context. Great. Thank you very much and thank you everybody. Shukran al jamil al hudur Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.